That was a great review. All right. Next, we have Dr. Vedra Augenstein from Carolinas Medical Center. And she is going to enlighten us as to what's new in bioprosthetic mesh. Thank you both very much for your invitation. Let's see here. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so we would not be sitting in this room if we were not fixing ventral hernias all the time. It is the most common uh, problem in general surgery. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, we, we have found out also that you need to use uh, something to reinforce the abdominal wall, be it inguinal hernias, umbilical hernias, or ventral hernias. You really need to use something, a mesh, and as we've heard from some uh, wonderful data and research already, uh, that we're using this much more and improving outcomes in patients. Uh, unfortunately, when you're fixing ventral hernias, uh, the most common complication is a wound complication. And lots of different articles listed here. Anywhere uh, in our group, about 28% going up to 60% uh, of patients develop a wound complication after a ventral hernia repair. Well, why are wound infections important? So uh, we actually uh, quantified at the Carolinas. Uh, Paul Colavita was our fellow a couple of years ago, and he looked at that. These are actually hospital charges associated with wound infections, mesh infections. He looked at patients four year on average and tracked them. And unfortunately, mesh infections are very costly. A uh, patient who develops a mesh infection over uh, about over $100,000 per year just in charges, and this does not include uh, nurse visits, it does not include antibiotics as an outpatient, and also does not include a reoperation. Uh, so mesh infections, synthetic mesh infections are very, very costly. So who are these high-risk patients? And I want to thank Dr. Melman, and she introduced our app, CEDAR, uh, which uh, not only helps you identify uh, the percentage uh, that, that is a risk of developing a wound complication, but also uh, it helps you counsel your patient as well uh, to get them to quit smoking, to lose weight, to get their hemoglobin A1C under control. Uh, so these are, your, um, these are your ventral hernia patients who are at highest risks. Uh, how about enterotomies, though? Um, I'll tell you, uh, this, was, uh, this is not not published yet. This is data that we're working on uh, getting out. We looked at over 4,000 ventral hernia repairs repaired at Carolina's Medical Center, and there were 75 enterotomies identified. And in the past, what we would do when we get an enterotomy, we would suture it, wash out the <laughs> abdomen, and place a synthetic mesh. Well, now looking at these patients with 38-month follow-up, uh, we have noticed that patients who had a synthetic mesh and an enterotomy, a simple enterotomy, during their ventral hernia repair had a significantly higher mesh infection rate and also also hernia recurrence rate. And this has completely changed our practice as far as choosing what type of mesh to place in a patient who is obviously high risk when they develop an enterotomy. Uh, this is a study that I presented uh, with a smaller group of patients at ACS last year, uh, essentially just looking at uh, how salvageable are synthetic meshes, really. Um, because a lot of times, you know, we think we get away with it, the patient goes away for a little while, then they come back with a synthetic mesh infection. Uh, this, uh, the key to this study is this 34-month follow-up. 200 patients, uh, about 75% of them are actually referred to us, but some of them are own, our own patients, obviously. Uh, the overall salvage of synthetic mesh was only 14%, and we try to salvage every single mesh. So what are our contaminated field options? Uh, we could just close the skin or just close the fascia primarily, and we know that this is, uh, the recurrence uh, of hernias is very high, uh, you know, with these type of methods. It's been tried before, it doesn't really work very well, uh, but those are certainly options. Or we can use some kind of reinforcement. We can use a synthetic mesh, a biologic mesh, or a biosynthetic mesh. And this is the topic that I was invited to talk about. Uh, biosynthetic materials um, are essentially have been around for quite a while. Uh, they've been around as, uh, in form of sutures and tacks and orthopedic fixation devices. And the way biosynthetic meshes, why they're so attractive is that they're supposed to form a, uh, they're there to form a temporary scaffold for scarring to form during that initial most important phase of healing. And then they're supposed to degrade and completely disappear. So the short course on uh, biosynthetic meshes. All of these meshes that exist now are made out of four of these polymers. So if you know these and somebody comes out with a new mesh, essentially all of them are made of some of these or a combination of these. And I'll 
briefly go through them and tell you about their different properties. So the polyglycolic acid, uh, the PGA is very rapidly degraded in vivo by hydrolysis. Uh, very often it's uh, copolymerized uh, with other polymers uh, that I'll talk about in here in, in a little bit that help with other properties such as elasticity and durability of the mesh. The polylactic acid or the PLA actually has a uh, much, uh, the, the, absorbin, uh, the absorption is much slower than the PGA, uh, but also uh, that means it hangs around for a little while longer uh, and it's uh, degraded very similarly to the polyglycolic acid. The trimethylene carbonate, uh, the TMC, it's uh, resistant to hydrolysis, uh, but the reason that this is often used is that it actually helps with the elasticity of the product. Uh, so a lot of times that's why it's added uh, to the mesh. And then the poly-4 hydro, uh, hydroxybutyrate, uh, the P4HB, uh, is actually made by E. coli. And uh, it's uh, very similar to, to both PGA and PLA and also has this elasticity of the TMC as well. Uh, so this is uh, a chart that essentially tells you, uh, and this is uh, from one of the papers that we published on biosynthetic meshes, but essentially lists all the biosynthetic meshes that are out on the market and that are being used and tells you what type of fibers and actually how much they actually cost in the United States. So. Um, now I'm going to quickly go through some of the studies. So the bio, uh, the vicryl mesh uh, is essentially mostly made out of the PGA, uh, which means uh, that it hydrolyzes very quickly and the uh, tensile strength is actually only two weeks. And uh, this is one of the first studies. Uh, it's actually from University of Louisville. Uh, they looked at 31 patients, damage control laparotomies that needed to, uh, for fixation of their ventral hernias at the time of surgery. And unfortunately, the fistula rate in this patient group was uh, 23%. And uh, this was a study in 1993. Uh, just a year later, uh, this was published in the annals uh, by a different group. Uh, and these patients uh, were divided by different stages, but essentially uh, the last stage, the four stages where the patients were undergoing uh, a definitive repair of the abdominal wall with uh, vicryl mesh. And unfortunately, a fistula rate a little bit less than it was in Louisville, but still 12% fistula rate. Uh, this is a study from uh, Dr. Yekel. It was in hernia in 2007, uh, looking at vicryl mesh again. Uh, they placed this uh, in six patients uh, and had 17% of patients with enterocutaneous fistulas, mesh removal in 33%, and then an incisional hernia in 100% of patients, which is expected for a mesh that goes away uh, very quickly. Uh, this is really the last study uh, that's on uh, vicryl mesh, and it was just published in 2011, uh, reporting again a very high fistula rate. Uh, the tiger mesh. So this mesh is actually a dual filament mesh, and uh, it's, a, it's a combination. The, the first part uh, has a PGA, PLA, and TMC, uh, which actually is reabsorbed by, reabsorbed by four months. Uh, and then the other part of it is the PLA and the TMC, uh, which is supposed to hang around for about three years. Uh, really, the only uh, human study on this mesh is in inguinal hernia repairs. And uh, the study was made to really see if this mesh is safe to use in humans. Uh, so they looked at inguinal hernia repairs, um, 40 patients, and unfortunately the recurrence rate was very high. Uh, if you look at uh, the, for medial defects, 44%, and then uh, for combined defects, 33% recurrence rate. For inguinal hernias, obviously extremely high. Uh, what was interesting also is that 16% uh, of patients had chronic pain, and almost 10% of patients still felt the mesh at 36-month follow-up. Uh, so um, there were no serious side effects, uh, but certainly some of these other things uh, are um, uh, kind of deterrents, I guess, to trying this uh, in, a, in a ventral hernia. Uh, the Gore BioA, so this is made uh, from PGA and TMC uh, copolymer, and it hydrolyzes, it actually degrades uh, by six months. Uh, this study has been mentioned in this meeting multiple times. The COBRA study uh, is the only and the first multicenter prospective trial looking at a biosynthetic mesh uh, in, in humans in a clean uh, contaminated or a contaminated field. Uh, they looked essentially at 104 patients and had results, uh, essentially 17% recurrence rate at 24 months. Uh, if you exclude the peristomal hernias, which in themselves have a very high recurrence rate, 
it's actually a, only a 14% recurrence rate at two years. Um, and then they also noted that if you placed uh, the BioA in an intraperitoneal position, uh, there was a three times higher likelihood of recurrence. So certainly using this mesh in a retrorectal space in these clean contaminated and contaminated patients uh, with uh, you know less than a 14% recurrence rate uh, is uh, very promising. And there was also an improvement uh, in quality of life. So uh, this is the topic is what's new in biosynthetic mesh. This is a new mesh that Gore has actually put out. It's called Syncor. And it's a, it's a sandwich of essentially three different layers. Uh, the layer that goes against the abdominal wall is made out of this, uh, that's the BioA, the old BioA, the PGA and TMC. Then there's a PTFE knit, which is a monofilament PTFE uh, in the middle. And then there's a PGA TMC film uh, on the undersurface that goes against the viscera. Uh, so this is a, a new mesh that's out, uh, and uh, there are no studies at this point with it. Um, and then uh, lastly, the P4HB, uh, which is also known as uh, Phasix mesh. It, it was first known as Telfa mesh, uh, and just recently has been renamed uh, to Phasix. Uh, this uh, mesh has full absorption, uh, about 12 to 18 months. It should not be uh, placed right on viscera. It should not be used in bridging repairs or patients who have a tetracycline uh, or kenamycin allergy. Uh, this this is the only uh, study that really uh, exists. There's no human studies uh, with, uh, at this point, no reports on it with phasic mesh, but this is a study that Dr. Matthews did and Dr. Deacon, and they looked at a porcine model, and uh, this mesh was around uh, for 52 weeks, but it did significantly improve the mechanical strength uh, of the porcine abdomen compared to um, the, the, the spot where they did not have the mesh. Uh, so it worked very well in the porcine model. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I think the take home point is uh, that we really need to look at these uh, products very critically and use the products that we know uh, have the most uh, long-term uh, human data um, and also just uh, preoperatively optimize our patients to the best we can uh, and identify what their risk factors are and get them prepared for surgery. Thank you.